Welcome to COVID Coping. My name is Dr. Darby Avashna. I am a medical doctor with specialized training in psychiatry. So these COVID coping sessions are guided from themes of conversations that I've had with patients, that I've had with my family or my friends, and we'll never be discussing intimate patient information in this setting. The purpose is to disseminate some knowledge that will equip the greater public to be mentally and physically well during this time. So in this first discussion, we wanna talk about fear contagion and how previous pandemics can teach us about behavioral and psychological stressors that may become important as the days and weeks continue and how we can set boundaries through this all. What we've been seeing more of this week is very explicit messaging regarding social distancing. Yet despite this, we still see people who don't seem to be taking these messages seriously. We're seeing anger, frustration, and social shaming on many of the social media sites. And we know that the tendency to scapegoat others is not uncommon in pandemics. Early disease sufferers may be highly stigmatized regardless of the actual origins of their infection. And it's not uncommon to see externalization of anger and blaming specific groups or individuals for causing or potentiating the spread of illness. And so while it may feel meaningful to do something rather than nothing, ultimately this scapegoating can result in injury to social cohesion. As much as we may want to change the behaviors and actions of others right now, what we can do is be responsible for us. Let's work on self-preservation in an effort to protect our psychological well-being for the days and weeks that follow. While social media can be an incredible source of connection and information transmission, it can also be rooted in negativity and it's been showing to worsen mental health outcomes. So on an individual basis, we can equip ourselves with knowledge of past pandemics and their psychological manifestations in order to be better prepared for what we ourselves might experience. So the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, in 2003, this outbreak was also caused by a coronavirus. It began in China and it spread throughout Asia before moving to Canada, Europe, and the United States. In an eight-month period, it had affected 29 countries and it had a fatality rate of 9.6%. During that time, nearly 40% of the community population experienced severe levels of stress in family and work settings. 16% showed signs of traumatic stress and used words like helpless, apprehensive, and horrified to describe their feelings. If we move to the H1N1 influenza virus of 2009, studies show us that 45% of people worried that they or a family member would become infected, and others described feelings of panic, depression, or emotional disturbance, while three quarters of people interviewed were likely to adopt avoidance behaviors. So in considering both SARS and H1N1, we see that perceptions of vulnerability or the idea that we might become unwell, this increases over time while our perceived self-efficacy or our ability to stay well but like as it goes on, it decreases. Perception of vulnerability and avoidance behaviors increase while perceived self-efficacy decreases. We also know that it's the anxiety about the risk of infection that is more likely to cause us to engage in preventative behaviors than a factual perception of the risk alone. So this means that in these early days when we're given a lot of statistics from other countries, that it may not resonate as deeply until we have a personal or emotional connection to a possible risk of infection. So put another way, it might be emotional factors rather than cognitive ones that lead to behavior change during a pandemic. We are less able to call on what we refer to as our wise mind or that part of our mind that is rooted in reality and facts in order to make good decisions. Instead, we see our reactive or emotional mind start to take over and we may start to engage in fear-based decision-making. So something called mass psychogenic illness can occur when large groups of individuals collectively develop a fear that they've developed an illness, even in the absence of disease. We're all at risk of developing this when our emotions start to become modeled after others. We call this fear contagion. It's a socially viral phenomenon through which other people's emotions and related behaviors can trigger similar emotions and behaviors in ourselves. 
So with this knowledge of what we can expect to happen based off of other pandemics and what we may already be seeing in ourselves, let's bring it back to what we ourselves can control. This is a wonderful time for us to get clear on our boundaries and to be assertive when we practice enforcing them. As an adult, it can sometimes be hard to know what our feelings are. Um, and what those feelings might be trying to tell us. And so our boundaries or our limits within relationships can become a difficult issue at the best of times. Boundaries are often really hard to define. How do we want others to treat us? It's not uncommon for us to have difficulty describing what our own boundaries are, much less to recognize another person's boundaries. So when we have a good sense of our own self-worth, it's possible for us to separate our own thoughts and feelings from those of others. We're better able to stick to our values. The difficulty exists when we relate this to the fear contagion that I talked about earlier. It's easy to see how we can quickly forget our own boundaries and start to engage in those patterns of fear-based behaviors, such as buying as much toilet paper as we possibly can. So let's bring it back to what's going to make us feel safe. Let's not waste precious mental real estate becoming overwhelmed or heightened emotionally by what others are doing. Take the time to sit down and get clear on making very personalized decisions of how you choose to spend this time. If they're clearly defined, it's easier to say no when invitations arise. It's easier to reference back to them when emotions become heightened. Some questions you could ask yourself are when and under what circumstance do I want to leave the house? Will everyone go or just one person of the family? When are you choosing to do grocery shopping? Who will do it? How much news do you want to be watching and from what sources? Is it worth setting a limit on media and screen time? How will that be scheduled? How will it be enforced? How are you going to set limits on socialization? What will that actually look like? How do you want to work through conflicts or frustrations that might come up between you or other family members? Imagine how it will feel enforcing these boundaries to friends or family who might not be taking the recommendations of social distancing seriously. Who in your life might not be okay with them? How will you plan to deal with that? How can you prepare to enforce these new boundaries? It's a lot to think about, and these are just a few examples. A lack of clear boundaries might mean that you'll be pulled into this fear contagion and you might start acting out of a fear-based mentality. With that comes emotional exhaustion. It comes increased stress, increased anxiety, and feelings of unease. We encourage you to start to notice when you might be engaging in this type of fear-based thinking. It might mean that you have to set new boundaries or make adjustments moving forward and that's okay. These are very challenging times that we are all experiencing. There isn't one quick and easy solution to this and in the coming days and weeks, we may all experience a range of motions that are new or uncomfortable or unwelcomed by us. Let's just be mindful that this is likely going to happen. We can always bring it back to the boundaries that we've put in place. Thank you for tuning in to COVID Coping with Team Limbus. Please share broadly and take good care of yourselves.